trucks that throw punches at each other at over 200 miles an hour. I've been in this business long enough to know when somebody's there and when somebody's not. A pass is a pass. The rivalry between Dan Weldon and Danica Patrick began in 2005 when Weldon won Indianapolis, but Danica won the national spotlight. It was renewed last Sunday at Milwaukee in turn one. Weldon hit me. Weldon came down. Maybe it's a little bit of inexperience on uh, her part. I'd like to break check Weldon right now. Just rip his front wing off. I was inside you, Dan. Why did you come down on me? He didn't have anything to say. My words, oh. my voice, and my vision. She just flies, Steve. Did she shove you? She's just being Danica. He was being stubborn. There's a lot of pressure on her, like I say, because she's not won a race. And if he thinks that I'm not going to remember that, crazy. She's messing with the wrong person if she wants to get feisty, that's for sure, because uh, I'm a lot tougher than she is on track. The rivalry continues tonight at Texas. It's called the Great American Speedway. It is Texas Motor Speedway, and we're here to race under the lights. Race number seven of 17, and we welcome you to the Bombardier Learjet 550K. Stop seven on the 2007 campaign, and oh, we welcome you also to Firestone Race Day, and has it been a busy week in the world of IndyCar racing? You've seen and heard all the excitement between Dan and Danica. The rivalry between these two flared up last Sunday in Milwaukee, and there has been a subcurrent of this rivalry brewing for a few years. After Weldon won Indy 500 in 05, he made t-shirts that said, hey, I won the Indy 500. That was in reference to the fact that Danica was getting the national notoriety. The rivalry's been getting national attention all week long, including Dan Weldon's appearance on Pardon the Interruption. We welcome Mr. Weldon to the program. If that was a guy who had shoved you, would there have been a fight? Well, I, I certainly would have pushed him back. I mean, I'm not the biggest of guys, but I'm not going to let anybody push me around like that. Did you consider, even for a moment, even for a moment after she pushed you, popping her one time? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, because obviously you have to respect the fact that she's female. But, you know, what I, what I do think is disappointing from Danica is the fact that she would do something like that because, you know, she's, that, that's taking a, a advantage of her gender. She, she really shouldn't do that. She does need to act in, in a more professional manner and, and stop acting, quite frankly, like a spoiled brat. Before your next race, do you think that Danica and you will have a little chat? If she wants to sit down and talk to me, I'd be, I'd be very encouraged to listen. But after her antics at Milwaukee, she would definitely need to do the talking first. Well, since that appearance with Tony Kornheiser, Dan Weldon, you and Danica were called to the principal's office. What a good jab now. What, huh? what, what did Principal Brian Barnhart tell you? He said, you know, you've got to come around with the right before using the left because I'm a right-hander. But no, it was, um, it was a good conversation. Danica, uh, you know, apologized for putting me in a somewhat awkward position. And um, after, after seeing the replay, I think she realized that it was much more of a racing accident. There's always, you know, there's always going to be different interpretations to, um, you know, certain incidents. But I think what we were both... You know, it's, it's always unfortunate when something like that happens, and, uh, you know, it, it turned out that she, she got the, the worst of it, but... Well, let me ask you this. Do you think it sunk in? Did what sink in? The fact that... The talk. Yeah, you know, ab absolutely. I mean, the biggest thing is, which we're both professionals, and you don't want to carry anything over onto the racetrack, particularly one like this, and particularly one where Eddie Gossage is, <laughs> is uh, trying to create the biggest rivalry known to man, but, you know, at the end of the day, we just got to go out and, uh, you know, try, try and win this race. Don't forget, keep your left up. Okay. All right. Vince? You, you flinch a bit. Unfortunately, one thing that was overshadowed by the incident was a very strong run by Danica Patrick at Milwaukee. Marched all the way from 17th up to 5th. Pro or con, what did you learn from the incident? I thought it was a really good race for me overall, like you said. Just learning how to really, really push through traffic and make stuff happen. And I know it kind of sounds silly, like I'm just kind of learning how to do that. But you have to really know the limits of the car to be able to push that hard. And, I mean, I'm, I'm driving against really good, really good guys out there. So uh, it's taken some time to learn, but I really feel like I've made a lot of progress over the last couple of races. How about what you learned from all the extracurricular? I mean, you can't buy that kind of press during the course of this week. <laughs> um... 
you know, I don't regret talking to him because I think that that should be something you should be able to do. I mean, you know, this is you're here to watch sports and you're here to watch what what we do for a living on TV. And, you know, sometimes emotions, a lot of times emotions are a part of that. And, uh, you know, if he would have just listened, it wouldn't have looked so bad. But he kept walking away. So it kind of fueled the fire. But um, ultimately, at the end of the day, I, you know, I made my point there. And I think that the, the risk that you can run carrying on with that kind of uh, of, a, of an argument is that when it spills over to a track like Texas where it's really really fast three wide the whole time we have big accidents and I would not want I wouldn't want anyone to get hurt so uh, it's all good between the two of us as far as I know anyway <laughs> yeah well we'll see Marty over the course of the next uh, 220 plus laps all right, thanks, Vince. The reference to Eddie Gossage, of course, he's the head man here at Texas Motor Speedway, and he's billed this as the Rumble at the Speedway. You see both cars. Danica's going to start sixth, Dan tenth. You remember that uh, Dan made reference to her need to win? Well, we decided to give the ethanol edge a look at their first 36 career starts. Obviously, Dan's had more than that, but in his first 36, he had six wins. Danica's still looking for her first. He had 20 top five finishes to her four. She had one more pole than he did in 36 events, and he led 737 laps. Let's bring in Scott Goodyear now because uh, obviously this has been the topic of conversation at every water, water cooler across the country, but there's a big difference between a couple of football players standing at the 50-yard line with a helmet and a pair of shoulder pads duking it out and trying to do it out here at 220. Marty, exactly. This is different than stick and ball sports. You know something? You're going the length of a football field here in less than a second, so you can't have this type of thing going on the racetrack. You have to respect the people that you're racing with. You cannot bring your emotions to work here in rotor racing, and I think the most important thing is that both of these folks get it but you're going to have to make sure you remember that when you put the visor down tonight well they sort of sound like they've put it behind them but we'll find out when we go trackside in just a matter of few moments for the start of tonight's race here at texas motor speedway we thank you for watching firestone race day hope you've enjoyed it don't go anywhere because when we come back it'll be time for the command to start engines and you want to know why this is called the great american racetrack well just ask the drivers High banks of Texas Motor Speedway equal. A lot of side-by-side -side racing. A lot of fun to drive. The G-forces make the racing entertaining. A lot for your body. Our constant. Mentally, it takes a lot of concentration. Accuracy. You do 220 miles an hour when you have walls. Massively good racing. Patrick, 16 machine, will slow, and it looks like she will pull off the track. Patrick, not happy at all. I'm in the wall. I'm so sorry. Whoa, 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 whoa. Why can't I go straight? Hang on to it. Well, this hit me. Well, this came down. I'd like to break check Weldon right now. Just rip his front wing off. Just some of the moments of frustration as Danica Patrick is now strapped inside her Motorola Delara. She'll start sixth. These two have not been on the track at the same time the entire weekend. They were in split practice groups. Dan Weldon will start tenth. As she gets ready for the command to start engines, we'll be getting ready to go not trackside, but believe it or not, we're going airborne. Roger Staubach, Pro Football Hall of Famer, is somewhere up there. Welcome to the Bombardier Learjet 550 at Texas Motor Speedway. Ladies and gentlemen, start your engines. When you combine hard work, experience, and a little bit of Texas heat, just ask our pole sitter, Scott Sharp. He has more IndyCar experience than any other driver in this field. He's started at this track 17 times. He's won here twice. So it's almost hard to imagine that this is his first pole at Texas Motor Speedway. But when that veteran driver takes the green flag here, guys, he says we should look forward to a good old-fashioned side-by-side hard-fought Texas battle. He's won here twice, Brianne, and uh, he loves this racetrack, and they are just about ready to start pulling out. And let's take a look now at our Bombardier Learjet starting grid, and on the front row is Scott Sharp, as he has his sixth career pole as they roll out. Take a look across the top. You'll see alongside him. You should have seen Sam Hornish's face when he thought he had the pole until 
the, the eight car went out and took it away. That was disbelief, I think, wasn't it? We were standing there when he saw that. That was disbelief on his face. There's Danica Patrick right alongside of Elio Castroneves on the outside of row three. And there in row number five, you will see the number 10 of Dan Weldon. So he's going to have to work his way up towards Danica if they're going to renew this rivalry. But you heard both of them say they really don't want to get into it out on this track with this 24 degree banking. Yes, there's a lot of banking here, a lot of grip through the turns, but you have to have respect, as we mentioned before, because you know why? The touch wheels here and you go off into the fence. We've seen it happen before with drivers, injuries, and sometimes career ending situations. You saw the number three Team Penske machine of Elio Castro Nevis starting fifth. If you were with us at Milwaukee last week, he was leading the race on his way to victory when all of a sudden the rear wing collapsed. Let's take you back. Turn four at Milwaukee coming out high speed, 185 miles an hour. Everything's fine. No, it's not. The back wing fails, drops down, and into the inside wall. The IRL went and looked at it, found out that there was a part failure there. There was nothing wrong with the wing whatsoever from a legal standpoint. So they will have some changes for the next one mile oval that they attend with the parts in their car. So there you get a good look at the uh, wing on Elio's car. Let's uh, give you an idea what to watch tonight in the race here at Texas Motor Speedway. Well, you know, the most important thing for drivers around here is the confidence. You have to have the confidence with your car. You have to believe in it. You have to have confidence around the traffic. You have to have confidence in the spotters who are going to be talking you all the way around this race circuit, side by side, sometimes three wide. Race distance here, 550 K is a little bit longer than we're used to, usually 500. Fitness will be an issue for the drivers and also for the crews down there doing all those stops in this hot heat that we have right now. We always say last lap, last turn at this track. Track position is so important when it comes down to the final shootout that last pit stop will be important. You have to have great track position if you're going to win this event here at Texas. And we have had some of the closest finishes in series history right here at Texas Motor Speedway. And if practice is any indication, Scott, this should be a dandy because we were seeing two and three abreast when they were running in packs. And I think that's an indication because right now, Marty, people know that they have to run two or three abreast if they're going to get past the cars in front with the traffic. That's the important issue here. The drivers believe it. One lap to go. Let's check out our onboard cameras for you. We have a total of six from left to right. Thomas Schechter, our pole sitter, Scott Sharp in the number eight. Dan Weldon in the uh, target 10 on the right side. Then Tony Kanan, Jeff Simmons in the middle on the bottom, and Dario Franchitti, of course, our Indy 500 champion of 2007. So six good looks scattered throughout this field of 20 cars. One car we should point out, Ed Carpenter has moved to the back. They went to a T car. They just didn't like the performance after qualifying. They said, we got nothing to lose, so he'll start at the back of the field as he gave up his starting position. They're into turn number three on the final pace lap. Scott Sharp and Sam Hornish. This will be about the slowest you'll see them for quite a while, provided we don't go yellow. And we've just been told they have waved off the start. So we're waiting to see what the call was there. Looking over. I need a quicker pace. I need a quicker pace. All right, you heard Brian Barnhart, president of the Indy Racing League, telling Scott Sharp he wants a quicker pace. I don't think he wants them all jammed up coming down to this, uh, these double kinks. Well, exactly, and that's what ends up happening is the people in the back are starting to anticipate they'll be on the gas before the folks in the front and it ends up in an accordion, in fact, going into turn one. So, you know, you have to run this 80 or 100 miles an hour. There's the cone zone that they're going into right now. You see Castro Nevis is on, or Hornish rather, on your right-hand side, trying to actually speed the pace up right now for Scott Sharp. Yeah, Hornish is actually forcing Sharp to come quicker. Here we go. The Bombardier Learjet 550K it is green. Coming down for the end of lap one. That's how fast it goes. It is Sam Hornish, Scott Sharp, Tony Kanon, Danica Patrick is up to fourth. Dan Weldon is up to fifth. Dario Franchitti is sixth. Not a great start by Scott Sharp. You gotta know that the situation as we're along with Franchitti right now, that the second time around, you're gonna get the green. And that, that is Weldon coming up on the outside of Danica. She's in that black and blue, number seven. There's Weldon right behind her. Frankiti on the inside of Weldon, and here comes Marco. Let's get more on Andretti. Vince? 
This is not a track that Marco Andretti likes. He did not perform well here a year ago, and I talked to his dad, Michael, before the race. He said he had a little chat with Marco after the crash in Milwaukee, told him to keep his confidence up. I said, was it a dad-son talk or an owner-driver talk? He said a little bit of both. Well, he finished 14th here last year, and he's had a terrible season so far this year, five DNFs. Now, you see Dan Weldon there. He is still hot in pursuit of Danica Patrick, fourth and fifth. Uh, Jack, you've got more on Dan? Yeah, it's Rabbit and Hound right now as Dan Weldon goes to the outside and tries to overtake his nemesis, Danica Patrick. His team told him before they dropped the green flag, try to get as many spots as you can in the first five laps. We're ticking them off. This is happening, Marty, at 215 miles an hour. Just nerves of steel by both of them. You got to remember, they had that stern talking to from Brian Barnhart, as Jack called them, the principal. They were in the principal's office. They know what's expected of them. Well, what we saw on that last lap, they each gave each other the space they needed. Danica maintains the position. And she is uh, ahead of Weldon, coming by the stripe this time. She's in third. Weldon is fourth. Ahead of them, Tony Kanan in the 11. Sam Hornish is your race leader. Now we're seeing a showering of sparks when the cars are going through the turns, and that's because there is some roughness here in the racetrack. Now, when you start the race, your tire pressures are low, your fuel full is full up to the top, and what ends up happening in the situation as we're aboard right now with Thomas Schechter, that you end up just touching the ground a little bit, and until those tire pressures start to build up just a little bit, then the car will start to get high enough off the ground. It will not touch the ground any longer. Thomas Schechter has led more laps at this track than any active driver. Jack, you've got more? Yeah, when Thomas Schechter unloaded that Vision Racing car on Thursday, and I quote, he told Larry Curry, it was junk. They worked all the way through qualifying. They shortened the wheelbase up. And last night after qualifying, Thomas Schechter went to Larry Curry and told him it's the best race car that he's ever had here at Texas Motor Speedway. Curry said, Thomas, you got to understand, our goal is to give you a win. Well, Schechter won back here at Texas back in 05. That was... Uh, Scott Sharp, there we are on board with Sharp, looking out the back. Sharp has dropped back to six. What's the story, Vince? The team is not concerned at all. Ray Lito, Ray Lito, his engineer, told Scott just before he got in the car, if we lead, fine. If we don't, don't panic. We know we've got a good race car. It's not what happens early in the race. It's what happens late. we got to be around at the end, so be patient, be smart. So they're certainly not reaching for the panic button in the Ray Hall Letterman crew. Look at this, three wide. That's Castro Neves up top. Marco in the blue 26, and on the inside, that was Vitor Mira. And now it sort of settles down. Vitor got some speed scrub off because he was in the very bottom. It looks like his car does not run down there very well for him. He seemed like he wanted to get a little bit higher, and now he's starting to scrub some speed off and losing some traction to the group that's in front. Sort of getting a look that two groups are forming here now. The top four trying to pull away from this second pack led by Scott Sharp. Back to the front four. It is Sam Hornish, Tony Kanan, Danica Patrick, and Dan Weldon. So these two in lockstep down the back stretch. We're working lap 10 of 228 here at Texas Motor Speedway. Oh my, they're getting close through three and four. Stay with us, we're coming right back. ESPN's presentation of the Bombardier Learjet 550K is brought to you by Bombardier Learjet, the ultimate way to fly, and in part by Bryant Heating and Cooling. Firestone Tires, the first name in Indy racing, and by Ethanol, America's high-performance renewable fuel. Back here at the Great American Speedway, you're on board with Dan Weldon, and this has been fun to watch. The two that have been feuding all week long in the nationwide press are running third and fourth, and neither is giving any quarter. They are giving each other respect. Well, they are, but I have to admit, i got to believe that right now this is just eating the inside of Dan Weldon because you know something? He never likes to be behind any cars that are in front. We've seen that all year. He's just tenacious. It doesn't matter what he's doing, practice or race. He wants to lead each and every lap, and I'm sure he's looking for any way right now to get past Danica Patrick. Vince yeah. Welsh? Well, Danica currently running third, and Kim Green, who handles the strategy for her team, just came on the radio and said, said, Danica, you're doing great. I'm very proud of you. Keep digging. They thought they had a good car before they came out tonight, but this has certainly confirmed it here in the first 14 laps. Jack Aroot. Yeah, Vince, uh, when you listen to, to, to uh, Dan Weldon's radio, it's pure silence. He is not corresponding verbally with his team at all. 
But Scott Goodyear, one thing to watch, talking to the drivers, they say that they can go out to the outside, but finishing the pass is near impossible. And this is one of the challenges when you try to pass someone on the outside. Very difficult to do. We saw here in the practice in the last couple of days, Jack, that everybody's been trying to run that high line, and Scott Dixon has been running a third line up there on the top side of the racetrack. They knew that everybody is used to Texas now. They run on the bottom. They protect the bottom. If you're going to pass, you're going to have to do it upstairs. Well, there you see Marco Andretti, but in that lead pack now is Scott Dixon. He has moved up to fifth, and we should point out, Scott was originally supposed to be in a blue commit car with a livery for the uh, anti-smoking or stop smoking campaign. They end up having to go to the backup car after he had a part failure in turns one and two and crashed the car hard yesterday right before qualifying. Right now he is running in fifth and as this is going on it looks like we've got a good battle going up front with Sam Horners, Tony Kanaan and look at this. Dan Weldon has gotten around Danica Patrick. And what she needs to do is just to sit back and settle down into a pace, start to run from the cars that are directly in front of her. She knows that she has a good race car. Let's watch here. Uh, this looks like she just got a little bit of dirty air from the cars up in front. She had to get off the throttle and got slowed up mid-turn, lost her momentum, and Weldon took advantage, Marty. And you can see that the race leaders are running at the 211 to 212 pace right now. A couple of cars. There's A.J. Foyt, the fourth, across the top of your screen. They're showing him in 12th now. He started 18th, so another one of the vision racers moving up as we are on board with Dan Weldon. Started 10th, has marched his way to third. We heard the report from Jack Aru, the, the guys, and we saw this also in practice, Scott. Pulling up on, look at Weldon. He is all over the track trying to get around the 11 car of Tony Kanaan. Remember I said he never likes being behind a car that's in front. Doesn't matter if it's practice or the race, but he's gonna have to settle down just a little bit. That weaving back and forth might cause him problems. And as we were mentioning uh, a little bit earlier, these guys have been able to pull up on each other, but completing the pass has been very, very difficult. Now he's got a great run coming off turns one and two. His car is definitely quicker through turns one and two. Looks like he runs the high line coming off through three and four of those. Car is not quite as good through that section. All right. What you're seeing on the left of your screen is the rear view out of the 7-Eleven of Tony Kanaan. On the right is the nose view looking ahead to Kanaan from Dan Weldon's perspective. And down below you get the battle of all four of them. And now five because here comes Scott Dickin he, Dixon. He looks like he's going to take Danica. Now, she's aware of this information, Marty, because her spotters are talking to her. As she's going around the racetrack, the spotter will be telling her, Dixon's coming high. There we go. He's high. He's high. He's outside. Still there. Still there. On your corner. While we watch this going on, let's get more on Scott Dixon, Jack Aroot. Well, fellas, you're seeing what Scott Dixon practiced all the way through preparations for qualifications. He went, according to my call, and mastered the low side in the first practice session back on Thursday. And then they worked hard in adjusting the car so that he could run in that second group. And my call told me that when they crashed, they realized it was a, a suspension failure and said they feel comfortable enough and hold on to your hats. They think he can create a third groove on the high side if necessary later in this race. Oh, Jack, I remember the years that I drove here, the second lane was always just a little bit scary, but they start running the third lane up there. Boy, I'm glad I'm up here, Marty. I'm just going to be watching that. Well, we saw him try that in practices. Here he goes, taking another run at Danica Patrick. He got up there on that third wide, but he couldn't get it done. He would back out of it, just similar to what he did just there. Well, the things we talked about and what to watch for is the confidence from the drivers that are around you in traffic and even when you're racing. If you're the third person and they're on the top side, you have to trust the two that are on the lower side, the very bottom and the person in the middle. If they make a mistake and you're on the outside, you're into the wall. Like somebody said, if you want to try making it three wide through the corners, you better have super glue on the bottom of those fire stones. Take a look now. As you can see, we've got six cars duking it out. The first three are trying to open up some ground from the second three. It is still Sam Hornish, your current leader. He's led all 25 laps so far here at the Bombardier Learjet 550K. We're at the Great American Speedway. Does Sam Hornish get his first win of the year? Stay with us and find out. The action is nonstop at Texas Motor Speedway. You're looking at Sam Hornish leading Tony Kanaan and Dan Weldon. They have moved ahead of the second pack. 
That is consisting of Scott Dixon, who's trying to close in and join this group. Danica Patrick fifth, and now Thomas Schechter has moved into the sixth position. There you see Sam's career on the mile and a half. She's had a lot of success. Still looking for win number one here in 2007. Schechter on board with him. He's on the high side going around Danica. And he's seesawing at the wheel also just to get that move done. Spoke to him the other day. He said we came here, did not have a great car. Look how close those cars are right now. Remember, this is 215 miles an hour. Made some changes, got the car better for qualifying. Think we have a good race car. I said, well, is it good? Is it comfortable? He said, it's fast. It's not comfortable, though. Getting awfully close. They're running in three and four right now. There's the view from the outside. Danica just holding that inside line. Here they come across the front straightaway, which isn't all that straight with those two little kinks. Marty, this is a different Danica Patrick than we've seen the past couple of years. She's now getting used to the big car. We're seeing the battle going on for second place right now between Dan Weldon and Tony Kanon. And Weldon gets the move done. That slower car, the 23, that's Milka Duno. She's now a lap down as uh, she is running in 19th place. Darren Manning had to make an unscheduled pit stop. He's three laps down in 20th. So right now, there is uh, out the back of Tony Kanan's car. And he has got, uh, well, he's basically the meat in a Target sandwich. While all this is going on, it's sort of settled down a little bit. Let's drop back a little bit further in the field. Pick up Marco Andretti, Scott Sharp. The 26 is Marco Andretti. And our pole sitters at number eight Patron car right there. They're both going around the slower Milka Duno. Oh, Milka drifted up. A little bit high coming off the corner there. Good thing for Marco. Minimal experience. He's only been around a couple of years, but great genes, obviously, he has with the Andretti name and just made sure that he could make his car run a little bit high and avoid Copy it because she just came hit, directly in front of it. one turn of front wing. Looks like you need to use fourth gear until we get rid of this understeer. There you heard Scott Sharp talking about his car. And remember, his team said at the beginning, be patient, we'll work on the car as the night goes on. So they're not panicking because of the understeer. Comment on Marco Andretti, who's running right behind Sharp. Scott, you mentioned about the jeans of Marco Andretti. And that's actually his dad's race car that he's running tonight. This is the car that Michael Andretti drove at the Indianapolis 500. Well, and as you mentioned, the 500, that third car in that freight train is our 500 winner, Dario Franchitti. He is currently running 10th. Now, remember, he came into tonight's action with the points lead. We go on board with Dario, and uh, as you take a look at his Firestone telemetry, you can see he's uh, five seconds behind the leaders, running in 215, 217. And the indication here of a driver is happy with the car is the throttle. Now, easing off the throttle just a little bit, and then car starts to push out, and the car starts to get that understeer. We call it tight also. Drifts up towards the wall. The front starts to slide. He grabs another gear. Let's see how he is through turns three and four. Now, those cars are far enough in front of him right now that he's not going to get that disturbed air like he did going into turns one and two. We're through the dog leg right now into turns one and two. Probably far enough away he won't have to really get off the throttle that much. He needs to make the car, guys, where he can get an opportunity that when he's behind the cars in front, he does not have to lift off the car, off the throttle. You saw the G-forces there. He Ten was closing fast. Here. Ten more. All right, you're here at the call. Ten more laps. We thought the window would be somewhere around 42 to 46 laps. So we're hearing now ten more would put us at 46. And, and the most important thing here is we're going to go back and look at some telemetry with Dan Weldon. Watch his Firestone telemetry come up. Let's see how his throttle is compared to Dario Franchitti. Can he keep 100% throttle all the way around? Now, we had a truck race here last night. These cars are on the track for the first time since last night. So that means there's different rubber down there. They use Goodyear tires. These are Firestone Firehawks. Also, these drivers are now getting used to what the car is doing. They're relaying that information back to the pit lane. Engineers are going to make a decision on what changes they're going to make for their cars during this first pit stop. Important to work with a car and get it better as the race goes on. And Scott, that debriefing has already taken place for Dan Weldon, and he has told his engineer and his track st statistician that what he wants is he's got the car where he likes it, but it tends to step out just a tiny bit in the corners in the back end. They asked him if they wanted a wing adjustment. Dan said, no, I think right now I can live with it. They won't make any adjustments, but they will be on pit road for 22 gallons of ethanol and new Firestone Firehawks in about eight laps. 
know, talk about bravery driving race cars around here. It's a love-hate relationship with this track for most drivers, and it's a big risk-reward ratio also as we look backwards now from Tony Kanaan's car. All right, so you got Hornish up front of Dan Weldon, Tony Kanaan, Scott Dixon, Thomas Schechter. That's your top five with Danica Patrick in sixth. We are running under green. All 39 laps so far here at the Bombardier Learjet 550. This was some of the pre-race excitement. The A-10s flying overhead, and one of these guys did a face plant when he landed. We're green. Stay with us. Back here at the Bombardier Learjet 550K at Texas Motor Speedway, Sam Hornish Jr. has led from the drop of the green flag, and uh, he now has about a three-tenths of a second lead over Dan Weldon. There's Tony Kanaan with uh, Scott Dixon in close pursuit in fourth. We're moving back through the field, picking up Dario Franchitti. There he is, and Scott Sharp as uh, Franchitti is eighth, Sharp is ninth. As we ride on board with Scott Sharp right now, listen to him getting out of the throttle. Now, they're going to do some adjustments to get rid of that understeer that he spoke L3, about that he's L3. having. And he also had to have a fourth gear situation because the car's slowing down so much in the turns. And he's right now Sharp's on the low side, Frankiti's on the high side, and Sharp with that understeer and drops that left rear through the dog leg in the front. And that's been a problem with anybody's done that in the past. It can cause some problems. But Scott Sharp has run out of all the options inside the car to make it better in this stint. He's got some weight jackers available to him right now to be able to change the handling of the car. He's got a weight jacker itself that he can actually move by tapping on the steering wheel with some paddle shifts. And he's probably run out of all those options right now so he can have that car getting just a little bit better throughout the run. All right, here comes Sam Hornish at lap 43 of 228. So the first to blink on this first round of pit stops is our race leader. And we've heard when you're out front, it's costing you in the fuel mileage department. Jack, he's coming your way. And remember, this is the team that trained all winter long to make their pit stops quicker. They've shown it all season. And Sam Hornish will come to a stop with 22 gallons of fuel, and they will make a slight wing adjustment. There it is, a half turn down. They try to fire the car up. He's off and away. Quick stop, fellas. And remember, it was the pit stop, the last one of the race that cost Sam last year here at Texas. Stalled the car on the way out as he came in for a splash. The next to blink, who will it be? Here comes uh, Thomas Schechter. He's already in. I think I saw Dan Weldon coming as well. Schechter on lap 45. And here comes the new leader. Dan Weldon, as we mentioned, he is coming into pit lane. Schechter's stop goes smoothly. He'll go back out. Weldon surrenders the lead to Tony Kanaan. He's coming. Five, four, three, two, one. Jack? Like, like counting him in, you hear the calmness as they tell Dan to reset the fuel. No changes. And a problem with John Hurt, fellas. And he has crashed in pit lane, and that has brought out the yellow here, which will be a break for some. And Tony Kanaan is already in. Now we'll have to wait and see if he can finish his stop. And they are going to allow him to make the stop. Tony Kanaan is getting a wing adjustment from the crew chief, Jeff Simon, in the front. They also made a tire pressure adjustment because Kanaan's complaining of a loose race car. So right now, it says Vitor Mira is our race leader. We're going to have to wait to see how this sorts out. Some of these folks get the advantage of pitting under the yellow now. Dario Franchitti is going to have to come back around, as there is John Herb, as uh, the former SMU football player, is uh, in the wall here in pit in. Disappointing for John Herb because he did such a great job here to qualify in the 19th spot. Let's take a look and see what happened to the 19 car. Well, let's remember, he's a rookie in one sense. He's had some races underneath his belt, but this is all sort of new to him. Trying to get down to the 60 miles an hour once you enter the pit lane, because that's the speed limit once you enter into the pit lane itself. And it looked like maybe the back end swung around from him. Now maybe he had a problem getting the car into gear correctly but that's usually what happens when the back end steps out on you like that well and that if you remember back at homestead is exactly what happened to danica patrick that is a much tighter entry into the pit lane and a lot of drivers have done it there it's happened here and it's happened tonight to john herb and the man who finished 32nd at the indianapolis 500 is going to be at the bottom of the field here at texas we're gonna step aside that's vitor mera he's leading right now and he's yet to win in his career
Back here at Texas Motor Speedway, we are under our first caution of the day as you ride on board with Jeff Simmons. Let's talk about uh, Kentucky, because last year, rookie David Gilliland scored an improbable victory in just his seventh Bush Series start. Will there be another first-time winner at Kentucky Speedway? It's the NASCAR Bush Series at Kentucky ESPN2 next Saturday night, 8 Eastern. And we should congratulate Carl Edwards on his win tonight at Nashville in the Bush Series. All right, let's take a look at the pit stop uh, while we were in break. Here's Vitor Mirrors. He surrendered the lead. Panther Racing Machine getting four brand new Firestone Firehawks. Wait to see if there's any wing adjustments in the front. Yes, there is by the front tire changer. A little bit slow, but because it's under yellow, have just a little bit more time than usual. And then there was uh, Marco Andretti as he came out right behind Vitor. And right now we can tell you that they have dropped back to 13th and 14th as a result of these pit stops. And Dan Weldon is your race leader with Scott Dixon in second, Tony Kanan third, Dario Franchitti fourth, and Sam Hornish Jr. who had led every lap up until the caution now is in the fifth spot with Danica Patrick sixth. Now they're going to have to have the wave around here because Dan Weldon is leading and the pace car is way up in the front of his queue with all these cars that you see in front of us. And let's get more from Jack Root in pit lane. Well, guys, the key to winning a race here is gear selection, and that's the topic of our Valvoline Tech Tip tonight. Now, the gearbox, as we all know, is located in the rear of these cars, and it is the gear selection not only for fifth and sixth, but for second and third that has an effect on how you will drive in this race. But when you hear drivers talk about being too long on gear, what they mean is, is they cannot get up to the maximum revs and the performance curve that they need. It may be just by 75 RPM. RPM. You'll hear other drivers say, I'm a tad short on gear. Now, when you're long on gear, the car tends to push a little bit. When you're short on gear, you get up to the maximum revs very quickly, and it will loosen the car up. So, are, do you want to be long? Do you want to be short? Well, that's why we race. Fellas? All right, thanks, Jack. Great explanation as uh, we're waiting for the wave around. And uh, let's show you what happened a little bit earlier with Darren Manning. He had a mirror problem. And this isn't the first time we've seen this. Now it seems to be happening a few times this year. That is on the left-hand side. And now it's very difficult around here. Yes, we have spotters, but you have to have mirrors to be able to see what's going on with the cars around you. Vince, what's Dario doing back in the pits? Well, because uh, the yellow had come out, he had not yet passed the beacon at the start of pit lane. So technically, he was not allowed to come into the pits, but he didn't realize it. So he had already come in and done the pit stop. But the IndyCar Series officials made him come back in for a drive through so they just went ahead and put on four fresh tires and uh, fill it up with ethanol. Boy, that should put him back instead of fourth, about 17th. Now, we talked about the mirror on Darren Manning's car. There is Scott Dixon. Take a look at what happened in qualifying yesterday. Keep an eye on his mirror. It came there. off and just flew. He went past him, hit him on the top of the helmet in the way behind. He said, you know something? I couldn't believe it. I didn't know if somebody was actually throwing something at me. He said, but I'm in qualifying. I had to keep my foot on the gas anyways. And he is in second place right now. And if that sounds familiar for Scott Dixon fans out there, well, you'd have good reason. Take a look at the last nine races dating back to last year. He has either finished second or fourth. Five times he's been in second place, four times, including the last time he was in fourth. So I guess maybe it's whatever. It's whatever. He's, he, he's tired of kissing his <laughs> sister. Let's put it that way. Jack, let's uh, check in with you. Well, how intense is this racing out here right now? Well, Dan Weldon just had a very terse conversation with his spotter high atop the Texas Motor Speedway. And I'll paraphrase. He explained to his spotter, look, you're going to have to be on the edge tonight just as much as I am. He doesn't feel at this point that his spotter is being proactive enough. His spotter very sheepishly said, I understand. And there are the spotters way on top of the uh, press box and the suites here at Texas Motor Speedway. We'll be back with the restart. Don't go anywhere. Just about ready to conclude our first caution here tonight at Texas Motor Speedway. We've completed 57 of 228 laps. As we're getting ready back to green flag racing and boy, they are bunched up tight. You're on board with third place. Tony Kanaan in front of him. Target Ganassi Racing. It's Weldon, Dixon, Kanan in a battle for fourth between. Looks like Danica Patrick in that mix. Also, uh, Frank Keaty, perhaps, yes. Hornish got shuffled back there also after the pit stop. Remember, you'll see two or three wide here. Remember, low tire pressures again, full fuel, 22 gallons of ethanol fuel on board. 
Take these drivers a lap or two to get the cars back up to speed. I'm trying to figure out how Dario Franchitti got back up into that position so quickly. Remember, he had to come back in to the pits after the uh, miscue when the yellow came out. Boy, Tony Kanaan is using a lot of the racetrack coming out of turn two. Weldon starting to drive away from him just a little bit. Now we were talking about the mirrors a moment ago and just thinking about them. The mirrors are open by IRL rules to be able to use them and change them as you will. And the first people to start to really make them into an aerodynamic device was Penske Racing. And I think now instead of just having small mirrors that are used for seeing what's behind you, they're now turned into being a situation where they're getting to be so large, so big, and so much downforce is probably put onto those mirrors and the air going across them. That's probably the reason why they're starting to be torn off. Sam Hornish right there in fourth. And here is Thomas Schechter coming up on Elio Castro Nevis. That's a battle for seventh. Schechter is in eighth. And we can tell you the reason Dario is back up there was because he managed to do the pit stop, get back out before the wave around. So he came back around and maintained a higher position than we originally anticipated. So that is the answer to that question. Whoa, it's getting dicey here. Oh, oh did you did see you the see back end? Oh, man. And we talked about this. When you're that third car, look at Horners. He's going to try it up there. But the air is so dirty, Scott. But you know something? And it stepped out. We heard Dan Weldon saying that his car was stepping out, too. Now, remember, guys, this is 215 miles an hour. He did not even take his foot off the gas. He just left it on. He's still driving it hard. This is a track about risk and reward. And those who want to actually have the big risk get the rewards. And Sam's done that here twice. Let's check in with Vince Welch. Guys, in reference to Tony Kanaan, you see him running second with the pack behind him. Brian Barnhart earlier in the race when Dan Weldon was trying to get by Kanaan and zigzagging behind him. Brian Barnhart, the director of competition, radioed down to Tony Kanaan's team and said, tell Tony to pick a lane. They saw he was being a little too wide by Barnhart's estimation. Yeah, he said in the driver's meeting, if you take the low line, stay there. If you take the second line, stay there. Marty, I've always said this, and I've said this to Brian Barnhart now that I'm no longer driving. As a driver, what ends up happening is that you go to these meetings, but you're already pre-programmed. You are going to go out there and drive as hard as you possibly can. And as soon as you put the helmet on, put the shield down, man, you just think about going forward. Ed Carpenter has passing his teammate, and where is he shot out this cannon in this backup car, Brian Pedigo? Guys, he is on fire. And that's starting in the last position. He has bumped all the way up to eight. He could not be happier with this car. Imagine going from a car that you had no clue what was going on with it to a car that seems almost perfect. He is loving this Hitachi car. He got to visit yesterday with the COO and CEO of Hitachi. Wonder if maybe they gave him a little, a little insight on what to do with this car. Well, they got plenty of tools to work with it. We've got some great battles going on on the racetrack. That is Koski Matsura in the 55 on the high side. He is several laps down. But we're watching Dan Weldon go around him. Sam Hornish coming through underneath him there in the six car, the second car in that line. Third place is Tony Kanaan now going under Matsura. And then Scott Dixon is in fourth. Why is it we keep saying Scott's either second or fourth? I Likes that uh, second or fourth place, but like you said, boy, I'm sure he wants to be in first. A little bit further back, you can see it's uh, Dario Franchitti and Elio Castroneves, and we're on board with Dario. This is what it's like at Texas. Let's just ride on board, see how Dario's car is handling. Coming out of four now, the race lead. You got Dan Weldon. Oh, and as we go back to uh, Franchitti, he almost slid up into the 55 of Matsura. I think that was a little message to Koski. Koski is three laps down right now. Probably just sending a little note as we see just so much movement coming off of turn two. Cars are being pushed up into the high line. Drivers are trying to get back down to the low side so they can protect the inside lane. And this is going to be a problem area, guys. This is going to happen sooner or later. We're going to see some cars touch and we're going to go for a ride. And it won't be a pretty one. That's Matsura. Again, he's uh, like three laps down. You're on board with Thomas Schechter, who's in seventh place right now. Up ahead, his next target is Danica Patrick. That's the back end of her, the Lara. 
We're working lap 70 of 228 here at Texas. There's the gap between Danica and the number two of Thomas Schechter. Now a battle for the lead is starting to shape up again. Dan Weldon on board with him looking out the back towards the six car of Sam Hornish. Now Sam's won here twice, both back when he was driving for Panther Racing. He's not won here in a Penske machine so far. Yeah, his victories were in 2001 and 2002. He was fourth here last year. Let's get more on Dan Weldon from Jack Roo. Well, fellas, watch Dan Weldon when he exits these high banks. That is his biggest concern right now. He just radioed in to Andy Brown, his engineer. I still feel like the car wants to step out, specifically on the exit of the corner. They asked him if he still wanted to change, maybe, and he said, I'll think about it, but not right now. <laughs> All right, Jack. You saw Dario Franchitti also taking a look underneath Scott Dixon had to think better of it. So now the top five have sort of gotten back into lockstep formation. But man, they are all over this racetrack. There is Dario. I asked him a couple of days ago if he thought that he now felt like he was an Indy 500 winner. He says, I know I won it, but it hasn't sunk in yet. Dan Weldon started 10th tonight. Of course, he's been the center of attention with Danica Patrick all week long. Round two right now belongs to Weldon. She out-qualified him, but Weldon's in front right now. Back here at Texas Motor Speedway, we have got a great battle going on, and the Champ Car World Series is back in action at Portland. Sebastian Bourdais guns for his third straight win in his quest for another championship. Justin Wilson is on the pole, the Champ Car Grand Prix of Portland on ABC tomorrow at 4 Eastern, 1 Pacific. Don't know if it could get any closer there than it is here. That's the battle for the race lead. You're on board with Dan Weldon on the outside in that number 16 Penske machine, Sam Hornish Jr. See that Dan has led 29 laps so far. Sam has led most of the others. We've had one caution so far. We've had a, four different leaders with five lead changes. And may we get another one right here. This is all going on, folks, at 210 miles an hour. If you're just tuning in, we welcome you to the Great American Speedway. We're at Texas Motor Speedway. It's race number seven of 17 on the IndyCar Series circuit. It is the Bombardier Learjet 550K, 228 laps here at the 1.5 mile over. I'm Marty Reed, along with Scott Goodyear, Jack Aroop, Brian Pettigo, and Vince Wells. And we're glad that you're with us as this is the kind of action we're used to seeing here at Texas. I can assure you that both these drivers right now have their foot flat down on the ground. Horch did not get the pass completely done. Weldon's back in front. Tony Kanaan's riding along watching all this happen right now. So let's set it for you. It is Hornish leading. Dan Weldon second. Uh, or I should say Dan Weldon is now leading. It changes that quickly. Sam Hornish second. As we take a look at the Firestone lap leaders, Hornish has led 43. Dan Weldon has 30. Vitor Mira has had led three. Tony Kanaan has led one lap. Let's check in again with Jack Aroot. Well, Marty, one of the reasons why Sam Hornish was unable to complete that pass is a conversation that he and Elio Castroneves had before the start of this race. I asked them both to compare the draft here to that spectacular draft we saw at the Indianapolis Motor Speedway. They said at Indy, it would just whip you right around and take a position away from the guy you were overtaking. They discussed it and said, here, you can draw a bead, get up alongside, but unless someone will stick their nose to your rear wing you cannot finish the pass we'll figure it out fellas it is Weldon in front Horn is trying to make that pass and the guy that wouldn't stick his nose there was Weldon's teammate of course Scott Dixon and, and a lot of the guys are telling us it's that location of that caution light that we see at the back of the car they moved it higher at Indianapolis creating more drag 15 pounds of drag put a big hole in the air for the cars that were doing the drafting and now in this situation here the lights back down to a lower position down by the gearbox so maybe not as much drafting opportunity with that light but also remember five eighths of a mile straightaways at Indianapolis versus the shorter ones here teammates are going side by side that's Danica Patrick in the number seven black and blue Motorola Delara her teammate Marco Andretti who's had a dismal season on the high side the blue and white 26 
We're working lap 82. This is a battle for eighth and ninth on the racetrack. Danica's sort of falling back a little bit. You know, and as Marco tries to get around her, in all the ovals races so far this year, he's either crashed or stepped out of the car because the car was too scary for him to drive. But when the car loaded off the trailer here, he seemed like he had a lot more confidence in the car once he got to the high banks here at Texas. Another great battle on the racetrack, a little further forward. Thomas Schechter and Elio Castroneves. This is for fifth. Right now, it's Elio. Schechter sort of has to back off a little bit. On board with Thomas Schechter, let's get more from Jack Aroot. Well, watch the way Thomas Schechter grips that wheel. He likes his race car. I just spoke to Larry Curry. There hasn't been a lot of conversation other than trying to counsel his driver. He told Thomas Schechter, look, just be patient. Curry is of the opinion that all this racing right now is like sparring. The heavyweight battle will take place in the last 25 laps. Then it's all about where are you in, as Scott Goodyear would call it, the queue. Well, Jack, you know something? All the people in the IRL, and Brian Barnhart says just run single file and put some miles down and get ready for the shootout at the end. But as a race driver, this is fun stuff, guys. Side by side at this speed, it's a thrill to do it. It sort of scares you quite a few times throughout the lap. But this is why the drivers are here in the high banks here at Texas. They love this stuff. And this place holds about 168,000, and every year there's between 80 and 90,000 here, which is better than any Super Bowl you can think of. So a great crowd on hand again tonight, and they're seeing a great race as again, here we are, Schechter side by side, this time with Marco Andretti. Oh, we've got a spin. They had contact, and Schecker, can he hold on to it? Thomas going to come back up? No, he controls it and gets it down, and we have our second caution. What a great save by Schechter to keep it from going back out onto the racetrack. Remember, this is just reactions. You don't have time to think about this. Remember I mentioned the length of a football field in about eight-tenths of a second. Now, I did notice his right rear tire was flat just as he came to a stop. So was there contact here, or did the tire go down? Let's watch and see. Let's just listen. Oh, a little bit of contact. Now the tire is going to get flat by locking the brakes up and flat spotting the tire and probably just putting a simple hole through the tire. Here, let's watch again. Marco's coming down and just a quick touch. Jack, you've got more? Yeah, let me recount for you the radio conversation between Larry Curry and a very disgruntled Thomas Schechter with the expletive deleted left out. And I quote, well done, Marco. Well done. They did ask if there was any damage to the car, and Thomas Schechter just went on a raid, I mean a tirade, about what Marco Andretti just did to him right there. Reverse lock, and now you are on a wild ride, fellas. So they obviously feel he cut down on him. Pits are closed right now, and it did look like he did come down. You got to make sure that you can run through there two abreast. Now, let's watch to see what kind of information we're going to have passed along here. Oh, well, he threw gloves. At least he didn't throw anything bigger than that. I'm sure that'll get the attention of uh, Brian Barnhart. So we've got a new rivalry. Last week, it was Danica and Dan. Next week, it's going to be Thomas Schechter and Marco Andretti. And uh, boy, Thomas is a lot taller with longer reach. If that one goes to boxing gloves, I think Marco better get some help. It's been a rough year for Marco Andretti. In the six prior races, well, he's climbed out of the car twice. He's crashed at, well, Japan. And of course, if you remember, he had more problems in Kansas. And this was the wildest ride at Indianapolis when he clipped the wheel with Dan Weldon and ended up upside down. Five DNFs in six races. And here's Thomas Schechter heaving the uh, gloves. And let's quickly go to Jack Aroot. Thomas, what happened? Well, it's just Marco. You know, we're fighting and swerving at me on the straight. You know, I don't know if it was the kink or what, but really stupid. I, I don't know if these guys are pissed off that a vision car is passing them or not. But, uh, you know, I'm just sorry for my whole team. We had such a good run going there, and what a waste to go off on a straight line with someone else, you know. Uh, it's just stupid of both of us. When the emotions boil over the way they just did there, how does a driver get them back under control? Well, it's easy when you're in the car and you're still racing, but, you know, he just swerved, swerved into me on the front straight because he's irritated. I mean, he's a good friend of mine, and uh, I don't know what's happening there. You know, he obviously wanted to stick with his teammate, but what a waste. Hey.
All right. Thanks, Jack. As uh, he heads back, we should point out, you know, he has done very well here. He won in 05. He has led 371 laps total, more than any active driver at Texas Motor Speedway. But he is out of this race. And Thomas Schechter's day is done with that touch right there. Stay with us. We are under caution here at Texas Motor Speedway. Back here at Texas Motor Speedway, it looks like feeding time at the zoo is all of the front runners. In fact, most of the field decides to pit. The top three are on pit road. Dan Weldon not making any adjustments. Marco Andretti is his teammates, and it will be Weldon followed by Dixon and then Sam Hornish. What a great run by Dario Franchini. Great work by John Anderson and then. And a mistake by Marco Andretti is going to cost him dearly as he has got to go all the way around. Brienne, what happened? Guys, I'm still finding out exactly what happened on that miscue, but Marco was planning on coming in with no changes to the car, just taking on get fuel and tires. He was the fortunate come up, had the fortunate uh, end of that situation with Thomas Schechter. Well, we're seeing the replay here, and he just missed the turn in. Didn't get into his pit stall, so then the team wondered if they should try and pull him back. You can see the situation right there. Kanan was actually pulling in. He's placed behind Kanan, so he's missed his pit. Now he is back out and around, so he's going to end up being at the end of the queue. And a problem with Tony Kanan's pit stop, right, Vince? That's right. Marco Andretti was stopped just behind him, so Kanan did not get a good enough angle into his pit box and did not get close enough to the wall. So they could not get the fuel hose engaged. And you see, they did not get the fuel in. So Kanan got the tires changed, but didn't get the fuel in. So a tough stop for both Marco Andretti and Tony Kanan pitted right next to one another in the pit lane. Okay, Marco did make his stop. He's coming back up. Vince, you're telling me they did not get any fuel in the 11 car of Tony Kanan? Or we don't know for sure. I just, uh, Marty, I just spoke with George Clotes. He said, we think we got a little fuel in, but they certainly did not get what they wanted to get in in the amount of time that it would have generally taken to fuel up. Okay, well, that's a tough break for Kanan because we've only had two cautions, and if you're planning on a third, it could be quite a while. We're still under yellow. Stay with us here at Texas Motor Speedway. Back here at Texas Motor Speedway, you're looking at Marco Andretti. He is shown in 13th place right now, but we have just been informed that Brian Barnhart is cracking the whip for this incident right here with Thomas Schechter. Andretti on the high side right now. He's going to come down to on the dog leg section on the front stretch and get the right front corner of Thomas Schechter. Now, Thomas lost the wing end plate of his front wing and also flattened a couple of tires, but, you know, there wasn't that much wrong with the car. I was surprised that he jumped out of the car. I thought that maybe he would have tried to get the car back in the field. And as we go back to green flag racing, Marco Andretti is going to have to go through a drive-through penalty. So it will put him effectively a lap down. It is Dan Weldon, Scott Dixon, Sam Hornish, Dario Franchitti, and Danica Patrick. That's your top five. And Danica has gotten underneath Franchitti. She's moved to fourth. That's an improvement for her because the last couple of years she's not been good on restarts or even the start itself. And that's something she's been working hard on, she's told me. And right now she's in there and she's just one of the guys on the starts these days. During this last caution, remember it was Tony Kanan who's currently in ninth position. They could not get enough fuel in. What's the latest, Vince? I just talked to his fueler. They said they did get fuel in the car, as you see the battle for the lead, but Kanan is having brake problems. So as you see the pack come up on uh, Marco Andretti, who's just getting up to speed. Also keep an eye on the 11, because they're complaining of a bad brake issue. And you can see that that puts Andretti a lap down. Thanks for the update, uh, Vince. So uh, Kanan will have to wait and see how many laps he can go, as the battle up front is just this good. It is Sam Hornish and Scott Dixon right now. And Weldon is, I'm, I'm guarantee you, he is livid with Marco because Marco's a lap down. Marco's trying to get back on the lead lap, and Dan doesn't want to lose contact with the front two. Well, right now, he's got to think about where he's at. He's not really on pace. He will lose a lot of respect from a lot of the drivers. And look at the shower of sparks. Remember, low tire pressures again, full fuel. And after that restart, Marty, I just looked out the window. There's not a person sitting in this grandstand right now. They're all standing, just like we are in the booth, going, I can't believe what I'm seeing. Marco did pull up. He has allowed the top four to get underneath him. So 
it is now. Hornish, Dixon, Weldon, Danica, Patrick, and Tony Kanan is on the move. He has pulled into fifth place. You're on board with TK. Danica looking to the inside. She's trying to peek around Weldon. Now remember, these two going at it verbally all week long. They started out this race side by side for quite a few laps. Then Dan got up to the race lead. Danica fell back as far as ninth. Here she is right behind him again. Remember we talked about this though. Length of a football field in less than a second is no place to bring your emotions to work when you're driving an IndyCar at 215 miles an hour. Vince, you've got more on Danica? Danica Patrick had been complaining of an evil understeer in her car prior to that last stop. They made a wing adjustment, and uh, Kim Green, the team owner and uh, handling race strategy for Danica, has continued to urge her to use her tools. And remember, it's a long race. So Danica Patrick, as they continue to encourage her on the radio, doing a great job so far, according to her team. And Marty, what Vince is mentioning, we're talking about using the tools available to the driver in the car. There again, it's the weight jacker, which transfers weight, say, from the right front to the left front to try and help you with the understeer of the car or also the anti-roll bars to try and change the complexion of how the car handles through the turn for you. Those are the options the drivers have inside that they can change actively when they're on the track. Elio Castroneves has moved up to sixth position in the number three Team Penske machine. Right behind him is Dario Franchitti and Ed Carpenter. Jack, you've got more? Yeah, Elio Castroneves had a wicked pit stop, stalled the car, and actually, while they were restarting, it said, what am I going to do? He has had a series of heart breaks, as you see, going back to the last couple of races. But again, Tim Sindrick talked him down off the ledge, calmed him down, and said, look, this is Texas, and they are now finding the rhythm that they need. One thing, fellas, that you know about Texas, it is all about momentum. Elio Castroneves had it go away on pit road, but he's got that big mo coming his way again. The biggest thing they should tell him is just remember last year he only led eight laps at the end of the race and he won the thing. That's what's the key. I mean, he's got plenty of time here. I mean, look how close all this is. Sam Hornish was one of the guys that led so many laps last year but had the problem, as you mentioned, Marty, just a little bit earlier with the fuel situation as Kanan now looks to try and complete that pass. He's been trying for many laps past his teammate. Danica Patrick. He gets the job done, and here comes Elio. That's Elio as you're looking out the back of Tony's car, and they're going to go side by side. Elio on the high side, and there's Danica underneath on the low line. Dario Franchitti, and there's his view of those two trying to go after the position. So Danica is fifth, Elio is sixth, and Franchitti is seventh. We have a total of 12 cars on the lead lap. Marco Andretti is the first car a lap down. That is a result of the drive-through penalty after the contact with Thomas Schechter. There they go again, going side by side. Elio on the high side, Danica down low. Now she knows he's up there, although he not directly beside her. The spotter's letting her know that, whoa, she's starting to come up just a little bit high, but the spotter will let her know that Elio is there. Jack Avery, you have more? Yes, Scott, before the race, I asked Elio who of all the drivers out in the field was he most comfortable running the high side on. He didn't pause or miss a beat, and he said, Danica. I asked him why. He says, Danica gives me plenty of room. It may not look that way from the stands, but in the cockpit, I trust Danica, and she's one person that I'm not afraid to go to the high side with because I know she will give me the room I need. Thank you, Jack. We're getting word that Thomas Schechter's crew may be able to get some repair work done on his car and get him back out here. There they are back in the garage, and they're strapping him in. So he will get back into this race, although he'll have no chance of winning it. The top six are separated by less than a second here at Texas Motor Speedway. Yeah, the laps are flying by. ESPN's presentation of the Bombardier Learjet 550K brought to you by Cup Cadet Premium Outdoor Power Equipment. You can't get any better. GoDaddy.com, world's number one dot com provider. Make your name with us by Polaris Ranger. Hardest working, smoothest riding. Speaking of smooth rides, here at Texas Motor Speedway, you're on board with Jeff Simmons. He's the last car on the lead lap in 12th position. 
What's happening up front? Well, it is Sam Hornish leading Scott Dixon, Dan Weldon by, well, just that much. They're all in the same camera frame and not far behind, as you can see. It is a freight train with Tony Kanan fourth, Danica Patrick fifth, Elio Castroneves in sixth. Do you think we're going to have a Texas shootout at the end? I sort of see this brewing right now because the thing you have to take into account is teammates. What are they going to do to be able to help their teammate win when it comes down to that battle at the end? One thing we haven't talked about, Scott, and we need to, is the fact that these cars are running again under the full rich setup. They can't do any kind of fuel economy run. And that's what they used to do before. As a driver, you could actually dial back and lean the motor out in the car. And what you could do is go from 100% fuel, start running at 95% fuel, or even 92. And what that really means is that almost like driving along the road and sort of taking your foot off the throttle just a little bit and sort of start to conserve fuel. That's what drivers used to do. Well, Honda's come up with a program. Every, every engine out there right now is actually using 100% fuel, so there's no more strategy. And I think, Marty, this is why we've got the racing going on that we have right now, because there's no sense of sitting back and trying to conserve and hope that you're at the front at the end. All right, while you're on board with Dan Weldon, we're hearing word that Thomas Schechter has uh, come back out. There he is on the right side in pit lane. So they are wheeling the car back out. They'll get him fueled, and he'll be back out, but he is already 29 laps behind. Now, this is not a bad move because he's going to go out. We've got a long time in this race right now. We've got 228 laps. We're 116, 117 laps into this. They'll continue to have him run out there in case there's other cars that fall out of the race and don't end up making the end of it. Then he'll just start to pick up a few points and a few positions as the race goes on. Right there, you can see the top seven cars literally in a freight train line. The top three have not changed. In fact, uh, last lap, Vitor Mira got around Ed Carpenter. That was for eighth position. There's Dario Franchitti, our Indy 500 champion. He's in running in seventh. Seems as if we get into the longer run, the more green flag laps we have. It sort of just calms down a little bit. Let's go up to speed if you're just tuning in. We'll get you caught up on all your favorite drivers. Jack Aroot, you're up first. Well, Sam Hornish has that Team Penske car out front. And you remember, at the drop of the green flag, when they waved off the first start, Sam Hornish took the lead. Then had to battle back through a couple of pit stops. Roger Penske just told Sam Hornish that they had just passed the halfway mark and said he was doing good. Meanwhile, running in the second position is the Iceman, Scott Dixon who has overcome the crash before qualifying and has gone to his backup car. Very little conversation with Mike Hull and Scott Dixon about the performance of that machine, other than they know that they have in their black book the ability to go to the high side if necessary late in this race. For Dan Weldon, however, this is a bit frustrating right now. The problem with Weldon's car continues to be exiting the corner that the back end wants to step out just a bit. But when Andy Brown has queried his driver as to whether they should make an adjustment, he has said, no, we'll live with it for the time being. Vince? Jack, Tony Kanan is running in fourth. Kanan has complained about two things. Number one, not enough rear grip. And number two, feeling as though he does not have brakes. In fact, three of the four Andretti green cars have complained about their brakes here so far tonight. But remember, Kanan has won this race before, the year he won the championship in 2004, and he's certainly a contender if mechanically the car holds up. Right behind him is Danica Patrick in the seven. She's the only one of the four AGR cars that has not complained about a brake issue, but she's saying that the car has had an evil understeer, although right now it's about as good as it's been all night. Jack? Aurelio Castroneves, this is a drive of patience. They keep telling just be patient and wait for the second half of this race. Vince? Dario Franchitti currently running in seventh. Remember, Franchitti had to do a drive-through earlier tonight because of a pit lane violation when he came in when the yellow came out. But they did not need to full up all the way on fuel. The last stop by, it was a short fuel, and Franchitti is running his way right back into the top ten. A good run so far for Dario, the Indy 500 winner. Brian? Well, it is appropriate that George Foreman and his sons are new part owners of Panther Racing because Vitor Mira, who's in eighth position, has had to fight all night long, getting up and then down, but he is making making up headway in the pits. Look for them to make a half of a turn in the front wing in their next stop. 
Well, and Brianne in the uh, number nine position is the eight car of Scott Sharp. And Sharp was the pole sitter tonight, but he did not lead that first lap. And his car has been difficult throughout the course of the evening. It has been very loose in traffic. And during every pit stop, this Sharp Rahal Letterman crew has made tire adjustments and wing adjustments each time. And right now, this car is not very friendly. Brianne? I spoke with Ed Carpenter, strategist and engineer Dave Cripps before the race. I said, this is a big gamble going into the T car, starting at the back of the field. He said, it's the only option we had. I just spoke with him again, and he said, breathe, the gamble is a good gamble. This car has been a good car for us all year, and it's paying up. He's in 10th position. Right behind him is his teammate, A.J. Boyd IV in 11th position. A.J. is from Texas. This is his home track, and he likes being here. He also says that he loves having teammates. It has been a huge advantage for him this year. Right behind Boyd in uh, 12th position is Jeff Simmons in the 17 car. This is another team that has had to fight all weekend long with different problems on the car. But right now, he's holding on, guys, with encouragement from his teammate, who's ahead of him, Scott Sharp, in the number. That's your top 12. They're the 12 that are on the lead lap, and 7.5 seconds separates first through 12th. Marco Andretti is the first car a lap down. We only have one car that's out of the race. That's the 19 of John Herr. Our first caution when he hit the entry of pit lane. You saw for a moment there, Elio Castroneves took a look around the high side of Danica Patrick, thought better of it, so they maintained station. Danica is fifth. Elio is in sixth. Sam Horn is still leads. He has yet to win here in 07. He's the defending champion of the series. Does he get the victory number one tonight? Back here at Texas Motor Speedway, as we are well past the halfway point, we're working lap 131 of uh, 228. And let's get you caught up here at the Bombardier Learjet IndyCar 550K. Started off with a great Sam and Dan show, as uh, those two were going tooth and nail after each other for the race lead. And we did have a Lone Star showdown early. That's Danica Patrick on the inside. You're riding on board with Dan Weldon. Uh, everything was clean. Nobody had a problem th until that moment as uh, Marco Andretti cut down on Thomas Schechter. Andretti was penalized. Thomas may get a penalty for that. He also has to go find some new gloves. Marco missed his pit on the ensuing yellow flag. So not only did he get the penalty, he had to go back around. He's a lap down in 13th. We have 12 cars on the lead lap, and now you know exactly what's happened here. If you're just tuning in, we're glad you're with us as the action has been fast and furious here. And uh, we're getting word now that Marco Andretti is slowing on the track. More coming outside, another one. Now you got one more coming outside. Guys, the problem with Marco Andretti, his car will not stay in fifth gear. They had just been communicating with him on the radio, so they're definitely having a gear issue, and Andretti said it just won't stay in place. It won't stay in fifth gear. Well, in that situation here in Texas, usually you use a fourth, fifth, and sixth gear. All those ratios are very close together, as Jack Root pointed out just a little bit earlier. You need to be able to keep that engine in the power band, so a lot of teams run a very close fourth, fifth, and sixth gear. So if fifth won't work for them, maybe fourth might, or if not, maybe sixth. But try to stay out there, trying to keep some miles on the car, and keep getting some points towards the championship when you don't have a chance to win the race here tonight. Well, of the 18 racers that have run every event, he has the second fewest laps completed of everybody in that 18. Koski Matsura is the only one below him, and that's like 64%. He has five DNFs. It's been a rough season. On board with Dan Weldon, not been a rough season for him. He's had two wins. Well, it did get a little rough back in Milwaukee if you saw all the pushing and the discussion going on. Dan, before the race, uh, talked about his feelings about, regarding Danica and her comments. Danica and that's you know that's that's part of her personality and, and she said that um, but but she apologized for that and after looking at the the footage um, she she thought it was much more of a racing incident that she once thought it was but I think she was a little disappointed um, that I just wouldn't acknowledge her but like I said I said Danica I know you well enough to know when you're in that kind of mood it doesn't matter what I say it's gonna be wrong 
And you saw over the shoulder of Dan, he almost lost that race car for a moment. It washed out on him coming out of the corner. Take a look at the battle for position. Dan Weldon is leading in this battle. He's third, Danica fifth. He's really seesawing at that wheel a fair amount. You can see him sort of guide off the, the throttle also. She, the car has now become actually very loose going through the turn. He keeps his foot on it, doesn't really scrub off that much momentum and keeps the car going along in third spot. That's called standing up in the seat, Marty, and he's just driving that car past its limit right now. That's the driver doing that job. Well, and he and Sam Hornish are probably known as the two that most can drive loose, that they're always on that edge more than just about any Anybody else. Absolutely. Loose is when the back end of the car sort of wants to swap ends. It's like the back end wants to slide out from underneath you. Now, when he gets closer to the car in front, you can hear him ease off the gas. See how the car walks up the racetrack right there? That's because the front is starting to push its way out. It's starting to get a little bit of understeer, and then it goes to oversteer. And where you saw Sam Hornish Jr., our race leader, again, he has to blink first here on lap 140. So when it comes to green flag racing, Sam Hornish is not getting the same fuel economy that the guys behind him are. He's into pit lane and heading down towards you, Jagaroot. I am already 60 miles an hour after being out of this racetrack. Feels like you are just crawling. But for Sam Hornish, he has Roger Penske and the Penske crew ready to service his mount. It will be a nominal stop, no changes, just a change of tires and 22 gallons of fuel. And you notice it takes so long for the fuel, the gravity effect to, to pull in. And as you said, he was the first to blink. Now he has to hope there's not a caution before everybody else blinks. And uh, the race lead now goes to Scott Dixon with Dan Weldon and Tony Kanaan. And Tony Kanaan just dipped two wheels below the line. So did Weldon. So there are two guys coming in. There is Elio, Jack. And Rick Reinemann on the right front, still suffering from that Achilles tendon problem, is wearing his brace. They complete the work. A little bit of fire. Nothing of major consequence, and Elio Castroneves, second of the leaders, to go to pit road. Dan Weldon is on his way to the pit, pits, fellas. He is, as is Tony Kanaan. Kanaan pulls right in in front of Marco Andretti. You saw Marco had already made his stop. In fact, they're having trouble getting Marco behind him into the pit area. There you see up front, there is Weldon. He's more towards pit out. They're completing the stop. He's back out underway. Saw Dario Franchitti also making his stop. There's Tony Kanaan. He's back out underway. And right now, Jeff Simmons is your race leader as De Scott Dixon peels off and is into pit lane. Jack? Scott Dixon locks them up, slides just a little bit farther than they like, but the front tire changers made the adjustment. No changes on Scott Dixon. And he is off and away as they cycle through under green, guys. And we're hearing that Marco Andretti is behind the wall, which if he stays there will be his sixth DNF in seven races. You're on board right now with first place, Jeff Simmons. And for Simmons, it has been, and there you see, Marco Andretti is out of the car once again. Here comes Simmons, he's peeling off. So great fuel economy here for Jeff Simmons. He's gone farther than everybody. Well, he should do. He's aboard the ethanol machine right now. Now he needs to get a good in-lap, slow it down to 60 miles an hour, get some service work, get back out on the racetrack and get up to speed as quickly as possible. He was 15th here at Texas last year in his only Texas Motor Speedway start. And right now he's in for the four tires and a full load of 22 gallons of ethanol fuel. Little wing adjustment up front. Pit lane is clear because everybody else has already stopped. They're stopped, and you can see on the left-hand side of the screen, the train is starting to go by, so he needs to get out and go as quickly as possible. And you're taking a look at our new leader as the target cars are going to go side-by-side side for position. And Danica's right there as well. And remember, when you're that third car, you're getting a lot of dirty air. Behind Danica is Elio Castro Nevis and Tony Kanaan. Man, this is going to get dicey. As this battle continues to go on, we're going to step aside just for a break. As though, man, if anything happens, we'll show it to you. Stay with us here in Texas. Back here at Texas Motor Speedway, you have not missed a thing in this battle between the teammates, Dan Weldon and Scott Dixon, and then right behind him is Danica Patrick and Elio Castro Nevis with Tony Kanaan, the fifth car in that freight train, and here comes Dario Franchi to make it six. Meanwhile, while all this is going on, Sam Hornish is starting to pull away from these guys. Vince, you've got more? Well, one driver who wishes he was in the mix is Marco Andretti. He's not. Marco, what happened? 
Oh my God! I mean, uh, it was it was nonstop. First of all, I got to see the the Schechter thing. I thought he had enough room. Um, so if not, I, I apologize. It was obviously uh, completely unintentional. Um, and then we lost fifth gear. So um, I tried to go six. We were running too slow. I came in for a pit stop, and the motor just uh, the motor just took off on its own. Like it started revving, and I wasn't touching the throttle. So. Uh, what a bummer for the NYC boys because I, I had a really good car and a car that could run at the front. So uh, here we go again. Disappointing for Marco Andretti yet to finish on an oval. And guys, we have six more ovals this season. Yeah, he's uh, hoping for a road course event very quickly. And our next one is Watkins Glen, and it's not for a few races yet. Take a look. There are, is second through about seventh and you're wondering where Sam Hornish is well there's Sam well out in front by 4.8 seconds because he was running laps at 212 when they were all bunched up here fighting for position these this group was at 209 and running side by side and just scrubbing off speed through the turns and doing the dicing that they're doing having a lot of fun as drivers out there and it's really thrilling for you but that's allowing the leader Sam Hornish just to sort of pull away and walk away and he looks in his mirrors and says just keep that up folks because I love it I'm out here by myself not having to run wheel to wheel not in confrontation with anybody we're just clicking off the miles Danica Patrick the third car in that freight train let's get more from pit lane well, fellas, I found it very interesting as we watch more side-by-side -side battling. Did you notice when they were stacked up, the two Ganassi teammates with Weldon on the outside and, of course, Scott Dixon on the inside? You know you need help. You've got to have a car to help you get by. Where did Danica Patrick, third one in the queue, go and opt for? Not the high side of number 10. You notice she tucked her nose to the low side of the number 9. And look who leads the teammate, Dan Weldon, now. It's Scott Dixon. He might want to thank Danica for choosing him over Weldon. Well, and I'm wondering if Chip Ganassi got on the radio and said, guys, you got to stop going side by side. You're losing ground. Take a look. This is what the action was like. And you're right, Jack. But Danica, ha in, in one other point, she has been running the low line all night long. But uh, still, I mean, this was slowing everybody down, and Sam was pulling away. Race and, drivers and are... Marty, I can answer your question. Chip Ganassi was totally silent on the radio. Okay. Well, he let him go at it for a while, but uh, it surprises me because Sam's lead, of course, is now 4.8 seconds, and uh, that's the biggest lead we've had all night. Well, you know, that probably will not stay there because usually... History shows you'll probably have another yellow as Chip Ganassi in the right-hand side of your screen right now. She's watching all the information about his cars there. Remember, real-time telemetry. You get that information. Plus, they also watch the race telecast there. That was Koski Matsuri you saw peeling off down towards pit lane. He is uh, four laps down in 15th spot, so not a factor tonight. And meanwhile, this is the battle second through seventh. At the end of that is uh, Dario Franchitti in the 27. And there you see Elio Castroneves. Now Castroneves has dropped back a couple of spots. He was fighting alongside of Danica, but he's fallen off the pace. You know, remember Penske was so strong last year at all races throughout the whole year. It just seemed like there's a tad behind so far this year on this one and a half mile type circuit. Interesting to see if they've got something that they can do for Elio in the pit stops to improve his car before we get close to the end. Well, it's not just Elio, but if I'd have told you we're going into race seven and Sam Hornish has no wins, would you have uh, said, you're uh, crazy? Uh, uh, yeah, I would. <laughs> well, he may get his first tonight as he is leading by 4.8 seconds over Scott Dixon and Dan Weldon. This is the biggest lead we have had, and we're working lap 158 of 228 here at Texas Motor Speedway. Don't go away. I have a feeling it's going to tighten up at least one more time. Back here at Texas Motor Speedway, you're looking at Sam Hornish, and this has been a rare sight tonight as uh, we're working lap 159 of 228. This is the first time all night where the leader has been out in clean air with absolutely no one around for at least 4.6 seconds. And here we go back to find the second group, which has got Scott Dixon and Dan Weldon right there. They're going around lap traffic, the 15 of Buddy Rice on the low side. And then Danica Patrick is also in this mix. She and her teammate, Tony Kanan's fourth. Danica is fifth. And Dario Franchitti is running in sixth. And there is Dario giving Danica a little run for the position on the high side. Well, let's get more on Andretti Green Racing for Vince Welch. 
Guys, I talked to Dario Franchini at length yesterday about this race. He said this is not one of his favorite races. He says he couldn't get any more different racing than what he grew up with. Says it's good for the fans, but it's not one that he enjoys. And in fact, team owner Michael Andretti told me before the race today, none of our drivers like this race, but we know the fans love it, so here we are. Well, and right now they're doing very well. I mean, they are in fourth, fifth, and sixth with the fourth car out. And let's take a look at the wins by team and compare last year to this year. Andretti Green obviously was not very strong last year, and we said earlier in the year they have improved. They did a lot of work in the winter time with their engineering group, got things done, three wins so far in 2007, including the Indianapolis 500. So that is a key element for them. They are competitive everywhere, obviously. One-mile tracks, super speed speedways and they're doing well here also and those stats were just for the first six races you saw there the number five car Danica Patrick going around the lap vehicle Sarah Fisher there's Sarah on the right side of your screen she is down by one two laps now she's in 13th position and there's Elio Castroneves going around her as well let's get more on Elio Jack well I just talked to Tim Sindrick and I asked him I said is there anything you can do to help Elio right now and he said no the issue is the traffic he said, this place, as we keep saying, he kept telling me, it's all about momentum, and what Elio's going to have to do is pick them off one at a time. And he kept looking at the number of laps left to go as he was talking to me. But we have 12 cars still on a lead lap here. Ed Carpenter is the last of those 12. He's 14 seconds behind our race leader, Sam Hornish. To give you an idea, a lap here is about 24 and a half seconds at the mile and a half Texas Motor Speedway. And there is our race leader, Sam Hornish Jr. Now, Sam, one of the things he does here at uh, Texas each year is have the charity bowling tournament for Speedway Charities. They raised $125,000 Wednesday night in that charity, 300,000 total now over the years. And here we go back a little further, and all these cars are in lockstep for position and as you're all on board just, with Dan. And they're all just cha trying to chase down Sam Hornish Jr. And you mentioned about the bowling scenario. You know, Sam bowls all the time back in Defiance, Ohio. That's something he loves to do with his buddies. But this week, you know who beat him? His teammate, Elio Castroneves. Bowled a better game than Sam Hornish Jr. Yeah, but I heard he was using an alley ball. And he did, he, you know, when, you know, when you're a good bowler, you want your own equipment. So I'm going to stick up for Sam on that one. Right now, it's a 5.2 second lead as Hornish is leading Scott Dixon. There's Dixon in front of Dan Weldon. And then Tony Kanan is right behind. And there, side by side, are the teammates. Dario Franchitti on the high side. And Danica, she's been on that low side all night long, hugging the rail. Behind her is Elio Castroneves. Those are all for position, folks. And that's the way the entire race has been. In fact, uh, this is the biggest lead of the night as Sam Hornish leads by 5.3 seconds. He's lapping at 2 and 11, and the others are at 2.10. So stay with us. We'll get you caught up if you've just tuned in when we come back to the Bombardier Learjet 550. You're riding on board here with Team Target Ganassi, Scott Dixon, Dan Weldon, Weldon in third, trying to tra track down his teammate. Let's talk a little bush racing. Last year at Kentucky, it was David Gilliland scoring an improbable victory in just his seventh Bush Series start. Will there be another first-time winner at Kentucky Speedway? It's the NASCAR Bush Series, ESPN2, Saturday, 8 Eastern, and also on HD, on ESPN2 HD. Back here at Texas Motor Speedway, the crowd of some 85 to 90,000 are enjoying this one because... Uh, Everybody behind Sam Hornish is still in a very tight battle. You could basically put about a second between Dan Weldon in second place and Danica Patrick in seventh. The problem is they've all got to find some speed because Weldon is still lapping quicker than that group, even though he's out al alone. He's running at 210, and he's got a 5.7 second lead over this pack. Now, we uh, did have some audio that we picked off from uh, Danica's radio, and I guess uh, she's not happy with Dan Weldon again. Let's listen in. Get up there, I'm with the official now. They can do it again. 
And guys, as you as you heard them talking with Danica about the uh, chopping, or as Danica was complaining about it, they came back on the radio a few moments later and told her, calm down, reset, settle yourself in, and go racing. We got a long way to go. So they're trying to calm Danica Patrick on the track. And right now, they want her to get in line with Dario Franchitti. They think the 7 and the 27 running more in line will make them both quicker. Well, she's losing contact with Franchitti up in front of her. Uh, you can see the margin there is uh, either the tires are going away or she's uh, lost a little bit of the line. But right now, as we take a look, it's Dan Weldon winning the battle on the racetrack over Danica, second to seventh. Usually what happens in this situation is the car well, starts to get bound up. That is Kim Green, the team manager for Danica, giving her some information. But right now what she needs to do, as you mentioned, is just keep her foot flat on the throttle and try to keep up with the group that's there. And usually a lot of times, as we see Kim Green on the right-hand side of your screen, the car starts to get a little bit of a push. It starts to get bound up. And then you need to be able to just make sure you can catch in. Now, all of a sudden, she's found speed. So did she work with some tools that are available to her inside the cockpit and make the car better? We're not sure. Vince Welsh, you have more? Scott, just a moment ago, Kim Green reminded her that the uh, bars were full stiff. And he reminded her that if the car is not handling the way she likes it, remember to use your tools. I know you commented on the tools earlier, but what does it mean when he says the bars are full stiff? Well, that's what we were just talking about just before he came on. I'm glad that that was found out on the radio because she was losing speed there. The car was not obviously being able to stick to the corner for her. And then I guess with those adjustments, and that's something the engineer can pass along too, it then can make the car work through the turn a little bit better, and you have to put less steering into the steering wheel, scrub less speed off through the turn, and now the car is working a lot faster for her because now she's starting to run with Dario, or before Dario was starting to drive away. You're on board with Dario Franchitti right now, and Dario seems to like the higher line, but that's a longer way around the racetrack. Well, sometimes, too, when the car is not very happy down low, maybe the back end wants to step out a little bit. You're sort of hesitant on putting too much steering wheel into the car going into the turn. So now that he's starting to run that high line all the way through, I'm only estimating from my year's experience that he's just trying to bide some time until the next stop and make some changes on that car to make it work for him a little bit better. So while all this is going on a little bit further back in the field, the battle for sixth and seventh between Danica and Dario, the lead is 6.5 seconds for Sam Hornish. He is still running about a mile an hour faster than everybody behind him. Sam Hornish, the leader after 179. It's the reload, it's the reload, it's the reload. Want to talk about the points lead coming into the race? Well, Dario Franchitti is your leader. A bad win at Indy, of course. Three points back is Dan Weldon. Dixon's five. Tony Kanan is 20. That was coming in to this race. Sam Hornish not in that mix because he's not won here in 2007, but he's out in front by 6.7 seconds. And right now he came into the race sixth in points. And if uh, the race ended right now, he would move up a spot to fifth. And you can see he has 48 markers behind. He needs a win as he's coming up on traffic now as uh, a couple of the green cars, that's one of the green cars from Vision Racing. And Darren Manning there as they go around there, and Darren's already four laps down. As uh, now he's looking to get around A.J. Foyt, the fourth. Boy, A.J. Foyt, remember 10 years ago at this track? It was A.J. Foyt, the fourth's grandfather. That uh, sort of got into it in victory lane with Ari Leyendijk. If you don't remember the moment, let's take you back. Ari Leyendijk thought he won the race. AJ, his driver, Billy Boat, was there, and he came into victory lane, and AJ just slapped him upside the head. And that was all because of the scoring miscue, and in the end result, Ari Leyendijk was the official winner by the time they got to the official results changed by the next morning, and it was just that problem with the scoring that caused that altercation in victory circle and after that the slogan became the race is never over until the fat man swings oh boy <laughs> take a look at sam hornish he's now seven seconds in front of dan weldon now we've got probably one more stop to go for fuel as we're watching darren manning driving the aj foyt car yeah, he had problems early. He lost three laps very early in this race, and he's now four laps down in 15th for the Foyt Racing Team. Elio Castroneves, we're hearing word, is peeling off and heading into pit lane. There he is on the right, Jack. 
And the way that Elio Castaneda finds this kid is a flashing red light on the right leg of Rick Reiterman on the right front. They're not going to make any major adjustments. Make sure he doesn't stall the car. He doesn't. He hopes that by pitting early, he'll be able to work his way to the front of the pack when they cycle through, guys. Well, we'll see as we've got 42 laps to go. Everybody's going to have to make one more stop. That, that's good for Elio. He's in his window. He can go the distance. Absolutely. Just a little bit different strategy. If you can't get past the cars that are in front of you because of the traffic or because you're not quick enough, try a little different strategy. So now he's going to give him some space on the racetrack. He's not going to be sitting behind all those cars. Maybe he can run some faster laps and make up some space on the racetrack itself. And the word is that Sam Hornish has peeled off and he'll be coming in for his final stop but again he is uh, going to be surrendering early which means these cars won't have to stay in pit lane as long the ones that will pit later they won't need quite as much fuel we'll have to wait and see coming your way Jack and remember Sam Ortis has a seven second advantage over second place seven seconds is a lifetime though on pit road the clock is ticking the crew has gone to work loading it packing with as much fuel as possible Away. And remember, it was his last pit stop last year that cost him the race. He stalled the car. Didn't happen this time. He is back out on the racetrack. We'll have to wait to see how it cycles through. If you're just tuning in, we welcome you to the Bombardier Learjet 550. We are working with 39 laps to go in this race. Dan Weldon is your race leader. Right behind him is Scott Dixon. He has led 51 of the 189 laps. Weldon has, but he still has a pit stop to make, as does everybody else through all the lead cars except for Elio Castroneves and Sam Hornish Jr. That's Dan's radio telling him he's going to pit this lap. He's going to dip two wheels and all four below, so Scott Dixon will become the race leader. Sometimes this is where the race is won or lost. You're in lap, getting through that apron as quickly as possible, getting in, getting your pit work done, and getting back up to speed when you leave your pit box. This is where the experienced drivers really make up time. Right now we're wide open. Wide open, straight in, top of the side. And we're hearing word that Sarah Fisher is down on the back stretch. She is slow. Jack? And now Dan Weldon will have to commit to the final stop of the night. They did a study a couple of years ago, fellas, and they monitored the heartbeat of drivers. At 200 miles an hour, it was normal. When they pulled out to the road, it doubled in the number of beats. Maybe it's because the driver gives it up to the crew for those 10 seconds and the pitch stop. That's Scott Sharp, our pole sitter. He was in eighth, and uh, there is Tony Kanaan. What's going on, Vince? Four tires and fuel. They told him you don't have to have a full tank to get to the end. Tony Kanaan, no chassis adjustments as he goes on his final stop. So they did get enough fuel in that prior stop. Here comes Scott Dixon. He has peeled off. Jack? Remember, Scott Dixon has had very quick stops all night, fellas, and under green flag conditions, that is fair enough. Driving the backup car, not the car that they had hoped to put in the field, the traditional red livery. The crew, of course, with the commitment to commit. And they have put them back very quickly out in the pit road as Danica Patrick is on her way, fellas. Sarah Fisher's made it to pit lane, so there'll be no yellow, and Danica surrenders the lead that she had inherited, Vince. Dave Popular is working on the right front on the outside. He's the crew chief. It's a short fuel for Danica and the fresh Firestones. No chassis adjustments. The AGR cars are handling good here at the down the stretch. 34 laps to go, a very good stop. It means Jeff Simmons will now take over as your race leader, second time tonight that he is going to lead. He has had tremendous fuel economy. You know, and that team has been doing very well with Ray Hall Letterman. The cars have been getting better since the beginning of the season between him and Scott Sharp. And look for them to be more competitive as the season continues. 16 lead changes now between seven different drivers. Whoa. And Sam Hornish will become your race leader as soon as Simmons pulls in for his final stop. So that'll be the final pit stop for those cycling through on the lead lap. And whoa. Sam is trying to get around the, the lap of traffic there and can't seem to get it done. Here's Simmons on the right side of your screen making his final stop. That's not going to make Sam happy on the left. Well, it looked like he had an opportunity to maybe get high. And here's uh, Jeff Simmons in, Brian. Well, guys, he's coming in for four tires and fuel. Doesn't look like they're making any adjustments. You spoke about him getting good fuel mileage earlier. That's amazing considering right before the race, he had a leak 
on the seal where the fuel hose goes into the car. They fixed it right before the green flag, and apparently they did a good job, guys. All right, thanks. And the yellow has just come out as we have problems on a multiple car crash here, including one of the target cars. And Dan Weldon is involved as well. And it looks like Elio Castroneves, the second race in a row that he has crashed. Also the 20 of Ed Carpenter. So the one thing we fear here at Texas is that close wheel-to-wheel -wheel action just at the very end of the last pit stop. And there you see the end result is it looks like we have at least four cars involved in this mess. That is Elio at the entrance to pit lane. Here comes Dan. And there is what's left of one tire bouncing off the pit wall. And Marty, you could hear the disappointment in Dan Weldon's voice when he radioed into his crew, we're done, boys. A lot of cars are done, Jack. With 31 laps to go, we get our third caution of the night. We've had 20 laps run under caution. Let's uh, go back and take another look. The nine car on the top of your screen is, oh, there, now there's a situation right now. Too many people trying to fit in one section of the racetrack at a time. It looked like we had the f wheel from A.J. Foyt, the fourth car, who was well up ahead, came off. Everybody was checking up and nowhere, nobody knew where to go. Now, there's a slow car on the bottom of the racetrack, and I'm not sure exactly which particular car that it was. You can see the tire itself is actually running along the road. Let's ride along now with the number 10 car of Dan Weldon. Everything's happening up in front now. He does not have anywhere to go. And he's actually almost like the bowling ball going down the bowling lane right there. And there's the tire that's actually bouncing and going off. And here we are in Tony Kanan's car, number 11, seven machine. Boy, there's just so much going on. Guys. Oh, I can't believe he got through there. The 7-Eleven machine just made his way through there. I cannot believe it. And if he hits that tire, look at that. Oh, he just misses. And you know, Marty, I always say to you that it's just reactionary. As you see the tire just starting to bounce around, parts are flying everywhere. And Tony Kanon just threaded the needle through there. Remember, this is all happening at 215 miles an hour. Now you've got the slow car of Sarah Fisher on the low side of the racetrack on the bottom, the number five machine. And that's what all the cars are trying to avoid. I'm not sure why she was going slow. If she was coming in the pit, she would have done that earlier on the apron on the left-hand side. Now, maybe she just pitted earlier a few laps ago, or a few moments ago, rather, and she was just actually herself coming out onto the racetrack and trying to get back up to speed. Going into tonight's race, there was one driver that had completed every lap of all six prior races. That racer was right there, Scott Dixon. Now, there is nobody that has completed every lap. We're under yellow. Stay with us. There's what's left of Dan Weldon's Dallara. And let's take a look here as we're under our third caution. Go on board with Dario Franchitti and see what we can see. Now, it's already happened in front of you, and we were looking at this previously. We wondered why Sarah was slow on the bottom of the track, but it may have been that she had actually started to slow down and react from an accident that was just up ahead. So she would have been doing the right thing. But the problem that happened with that is the other cars there that you see, the 20 of Ed Carpenter and the 9 of Scott Dixon and also the 14 of Darren Manning did not get that information from their spotters to start slowing down. And there you can see the 22 of A.J. Foyt, the fourth, has already started to slow down because he's lost his right rear tire that is starting to just bounce around throughout the racetrack. Now, Foyt pitted on lap 192. The crash happened on 197. Look at this move by Tony Kanaan as we go to Jackaroot. Well, a very, de very dejected Dan Weldon has just watched the first replay, your first opportunity. Dan, it, it happened so quick. Yeah, just, you know, a little bit of bad luck for uh, the guys at Target Chip Ganassi Racing and myself. It was um, un unfortunate, but uh, we just didn't quite have the speed today. But nonetheless, I think everybody tried real hard. Um, Here's the onboard. Yeah, so, yeah, it's just, just, just unfortunate. There's, there's really not much I could do, so it's, it's disappointing for everybody. But uh, you know, I've, I've had worse happen to me. We need to just bounce back and uh, be strong and, and try and win the next race.
Thanks, Dan. Let me give you an update, too, on his teammate, Scott Dixon. Dixon got out of the car, but the crew is still working, and Dixon is ready, if necessary, to go back in and try and log some laps. He's shown in 10th right now, five laps down as this caution continues. You can see the work going on. There are the cars that were involved in the crash, a total of six. Elio Castroneves, his car is done. Dixon, they're working on. Weldon's done. Manning is still out there. There he is. Ed Carpenter, it looks like he's finished. And A.J. Foyt, the fourth. Let's go to Jack. Well, Elio, when it happens that quickly, there's not a lot you can do as a driver, is there? Not much. I mean, I saw smoke. I was behind uh, uh, Weldon. And all of a sudden, um, my spotter saying, go low, go low. I shoot straight low. And for a point, I'm like, okay, I missed everything. It was perfect. But suddenly, boom. I was like, what was that again? I guess it's snowball, you know, from Milwaukee. And now here, you know what the good news is? We are gonna have a weekend off, regroup ourselves, and keep moving forward. You get a bunch of rapid splits on the weekend, huh? <laughs> a lot, no, you know, I trust the guy upstairs. He's still a lot of championship, we'll be good. Let's go to Brienne Pedigo. Well, guys, the disappointed vision crew of AJ Foyt the fourth has cleared out of the pits. I just spoke with Tony George, and he said they they came into the pits. AJ radioed in, said he's coming in. They changed the tires, and after only six laps, the right rear did come off. That was apparently what caused the incident, guys. All right, so that gives us a definitive look at what happened because we saw the end result. We're going to uh, take a break here, and we're still under yellow here at Texas. Just as we come back here to Texas Motor Speedway, we're going back to green flag racing. And out in front, it is Sam Hornish leading Tony Kanaan. Danica Patrick is in third. There's some lap traffic in between these cars. Now, Tony wants to get past these cars as quickly as possible because Sam has had the pace tonight, and he wants to be able to get up behind him and start to be able to get a bit of a draft off Sam if he has a chance of being able to stay with him. That eight car of Scott Sharp, the fourth car in line, he has a lap down in seventh. There are only six cars on the lead lap right now. It's Sam Hornish, Tony Kanaan, Danica Patrick, Vitor Mira, Dario Franchitti, Jeff Simmons. That's the six that are on the lead lap. And as Sam begins to pull away again, that's Tony right behind him now. He's gotten around the lap traffic. Here are the Firestone lap leaders, and Sam has dominated tonight, leading 138 laps. He's not had much luck here in this last year or two, but certainly looks like tonight is for him to win. Just has to make sure he plays it smart. Obviously, with that crash, there's a lot less traffic that's going to be on the racetrack now, a lot less cars, so he's not going to have to worry too much about that. And Danica and Dario are having trouble getting around the lap vehicles. There's Vitor Mira. That's for position. He's duking it out with Jeff Simmons there in the 17. They are battling for position. That car in front of them, the 15, is not part of the mix. They're a lap down at least. That's Danica trying to get around the lap vehicle of Scott Sharp. There we're on board with Dario again. From Simmons' viewpoint, this is for fifth and sixth. And hey Marty, we're still running laps at 212, almost 213 miles an hour that last time around. Danica, you see her trying to find a way to get underneath Scott Sharp, and she may have gotten her opening. Well, this is board. where, exactly, and this is where Scott Sharp, who's down one lap, just needs to be able to make some space and allow her to get through so she has the opportunity to go back up there and race with the leaders. 17 laps to go here at Texas. Right now, Sam Hornish would pick up a spot in the points if he stays out in front. But here comes Tony Kanaan, closing quickly now, as this is turning into a two-car battle. Jack? Yeah, Marty and Roger Penske, who never misses a shot, already radioed into his driver. Look, Kanan is better down low, so he wants to force Tony Kanan to the high side if Kanan tries to make a pass on his driver. Well, we'll watch that line as they continue to run here. As here you see, Sam's two wins here. Of course, Tony, the winner last time out at Milwaukee, would like to make it two in a row. He is, if it ends right now, he'd pick up two spots in the points from fourth to second. And back a little bit further from these two is Danica Patrick. This is a career best run for her. Remember, her best has been four times in fourth. There she is, and she is trying to close the gap. It's about 1.1 seconds. 
What she needs to do is just to try and run directly behind the two cars that are in front. She wants to keep her foot flat on the gas all the way around. And try to hope that those two guys up front are actually starting to run side by slide to make them slower. Interesting to hear from Kim Green, though. When you get up there, you can help TK out. Remember, we talked about what to watch for with the situation. Will the team players start to help each other get a victory towards the end? Vince? Scott, you're exactly right. During that last yellow, Tony Kanan came on the radio, and he told his team to spread the word. Remember, we're all teammates here at the time. He was running second, Danica was third, and Dario Franchitti was fourth. He said, let's be smart and get good results and get out of here with our cars intact. Right now, the TK making a move for the win, and his teammates aren't far back. And you're on board with Dario Franchitti. That's a battle for position with Vitor Mira, fourth and fifth. And this is exactly what Danica Patrick wants to see because it keeps those two guys slow, so they're not going to have a shot at her. She just ran 213.4, then 213.3. The last couple of laps, she is gaining on the group in front. In fact, she's the fastest car on the racetrack right now. Can Danica get up there, and then can she pull it off for her first win? Or does Sam get his first of the year? and the action is getting nose to tail for the top three spots. It's Sam Hornish here at Texas Motor Speedway with 11 to go and Tony Kanan, Danica Patrick and Danica is the fastest car on the racetrack. Take a look, 213 to 211. 10 laps left to go and everybody's standing in Texas, Marty. They're all standing up here in the grandstand right now. She's absolutely fast. She's only five feet tall, but boy, she's got a lot of determination for a young lady driver here in Texas tonight. Take a look, there you'll see the crowd and everybody there is standing. And look at them cheering them on. Pick your favorite driver. The hardest part being that third car in the line is all that dirty air. Once you get up there, it's almost impossible to get around unless these two start dancing. Well, Tony's trying to psych out Sam Hornish right now, letting him think that he might go high, hoping that Sam sort of runs a high line to allow Tony get on the low side. But once you open that door just a little bit and let the car nose come up there, it's going to be very close. Now, Danica has to also be aware that if these two touch, she wants to be close enough to be able to get by, but not too close where you're going to get involved in it like we just saw a few minutes ago with that other big wreck. Lap traffic, not a factor. That's the nine car of... Scott Dixon, who's got back out to circulate to try to collect some points. Brian, you've got more on Danica? Well, guys, what a sweet relief of victory would be for Danica Patrick. Her team is cheering her on down here. She knows that she is fast on the track. She knows that she has caught up with these guys. And her attitude, guys, she's been quiet in the car, except for when she made that pass around Scott Sharp. She said, get him out of my way. She is on a mission, you guys. They are good on fuel, and this might be her day. Seven laps to go. The question is, can she get around not only one, but both of them? That's going to be the hardest part. Tony's got his hands full just trying to get rid of Sam. Well, it's one thing to get caught up to the group because we saw that she was running those 213, almost 214 mile an hour laps sometimes. But then it's another thing to pass. You know Sam Harnish. So five to go. She's getting the word from Kim Green. Keep with Tony. But Sam's not going to move off that low line, guys. He's going to keep down there and keep that bottom lane shut off to Tony Kanon. If they can get lockstep, Tony's looking at the high side. It's the farther way around. Danica's starting to fade. With five laps to go, she's losing contact with these two. That's Bev Patrick, Danica's mom. Even if she doesn't win, this will still be a career best finish if she stays right there. Four laps to go. And this is a different Danica Patrick this year than it was last year or the year previously. She is aggressive. She is comfortable with the race car. She knows how to do the starts and the restarts now. She's getting all the help from her teammates, and she's getting more experience, and she's going to be a winner sooner or later here in the IndyCar Series. Three laps to go. It is still a battle up front. Tony Kanan way wide. Danica tries to follow him. Sam drifts up a little higher, then get tucks right back down to the low line. This time by, it'll be two laps to go here at Texas Motor Speedway. Does Sam pick up his first win of the year? Or does Tony do it again, go back to back from Milwaukee?
Now watch Tony. He tries for these slingshots all the time, coming off the turn, trying to keep his momentum going. Coming to the white flag this time by. Here it is, one to go. White flag. Remember we said last lap, last turn, that's what it'll come down to. And in the high side, Tony knows he's gonna have to do it up top if he's gonna get it done. Down the back stretch, he tucks back in underneath. The last time Sam Hornish won was last year at Kentucky, almost a full season ago. It seems like it to Sam. Coming down to the checkered flag, Sam Hornish. Good work, buddy, good work. Take a look further back. It's Frankini getting around Mira for fourth. And Sam picks up his first win of the season and 19th of his career, Jack Aruf. Well, Roger Penske getting the congratulations from his crew. Roger, hard to believe that this is the first win for Sam this season. What turned it around tonight? Well, I think we had great stops. Uh, he drove a great race. I think we had a good race car. We've been struggling a little bit on the mile and a half, and I think Tom German and he got a, you know, a good setup for tonight. You can see we were competitive all the way through, but uh, hey, flawless in the pits, which you have to have, and uh, un unfortunate for the guys on the track that got wrecked. But uh, Tony's a tough guy to beat. We needed to get that one across the finish line. What I found interesting is you were very perceptive and proactive with your driver early on before, when they, before the end of this race. You cautioned him about not leaving the downstairs open because your guys had already seen Kanan was so good downside. Yeah, we got uh, some input from Elio there that he was better on the bottom, so we kept the bottom to ourselves, and uh, that certainly helped us there the last 20 laps. Let's go upstairs. And Sam Hornish, as you see, Michael Andretti, he has second and third in his hip pocket. Also fourth with Dario Franchitti. A strong run for that young lady right there. A career best finish for Danica. But for Sam, he becomes the first three-time winner here in Texas. And we'll talk to him when we come back. ESPN's presentation of the Bombardier Learjet 550K brought to you by Bombardier Learjet, the ultimate way to fly. In part by ethanol, America's high-performance renewable fuel. Peak antifreeze. When you peak, you win. And by Bryant Heating and Cooling. And there we're in victory lane. Let's check in with Vince Welch. Sam Hornish Jr. climbing out. He got on the radio right afterwards and thanked his crew for giving him flawless stops throughout the course of the night. It's been a long time coming, and Marty and Scott made the reference earlier in the broadcast about if you would have told them that it would be seven races before Sam Hornish Jr. got a victory, someone would have thought you were crazy. But indeed, it's been that long, almost a year now, for Hornish to get in victory lane, but he drives to victory lane at Texas Motor Speedway for the third time in his career, the first time wearing the Hornish or the uh, Penske colors as uh, his crew comes in and congratulates him, shouts of Sam, you're the man, as he uh, starts uh, taking off his helmet and his head sock. Let's bring him in. Sam, how did you hold off Kanan and uh, Danica, who was really the fastest of the three of you there down the stretch? Well, uh, we had a good car all night long, and obviously when you lead here, you're probably the slower of the three cars, so um, we ran some really good laps the only times we got in traffic, but the uh, car was awesome tonight. Team did a great job picking the gears. Awesome job in the pits as usual. Pretty much had a flawless night, and we were loving it when we had the nine-second lead. That was great for us, but uh, fortunately it didn't end up that way. First win of the season for you in the seventh race. I know that's something that uh, has been a little difficult for you to, to get used to. How, how good does it feel right now to be standing in victory lane and get that first win of the season? Well, it feels awesome, especially to come to a place like Texas. Uh, the, the Motor Speedway here, you know, uh, Eddie Gossage, all the people here are awesome. And, uh, you know, a place where I've had uh, so many good memories of winning championships here and uh, winning races here. And uh, just, you know, really looking forward to uh, the rest of the season. This was a, a great day for us in the points, and uh, hopefully we'll continue to rebound. And like I said earlier, we weren't having a bad year. We just didn't get the things to click right to where we could get to victory lane and get the big points. They click tonight. Sam Hornish Jr. is your winner. Brianne? Well, Danica, best career finish. After the week you've had, how good does this feel? <laughs> it feels good. You know, we uh, we were strong all weekend, and um, I was I was happy going into the race. We didn't we didn't have the qualifying that we wanted, unfortunately, but uh, and that showed really because as soon as I as soon as you got back a couple of cars, five, six, seven, eight cars in the in the run, it was just 
pushing and really hard to run because everybody's flat out, especially in the front. So the further the further the front, the better you were. And uh, it's just a shame Tony and I didn't have more time to get Sam. But uh, Tony drove a good race, and uh, so did Dario without fifth gear. So my guys did good. What happened at the beginning of the race with you and Weldon? Um, I don't know. What did happen? Well, we heard a little bit of you talking about cutting and... Yeah, you know, uh, you know, just on the track, he was going really high in the middle of the corner and then chopping down right on the right at the exit of the corner. And all that does is just, it's an inconsistency with your line and it, ch you know, takes the air away from you. So, um, you know, Dan or anybody else, I would have called up to my spotter and said the same thing. Well, she's got a smile on her face this week, guy. Well, two others had career best finishes tonight. Jeff Simmons with a sixth, Milka Duno with an 11th. Let's take a look at the points because some big changes. Dario Franchitti stays on top, but look at Tony Kanaan. He jumps up to Dan Weldon drops to Danica comes up two spots as well. Thomas Schechter drops three. Final thoughts? You know, we're seeing a great run to the championship here. Points are everything. I think it's going to be a battle down to the last race. There's no doubt about it. Sam Hornish Jr. becomes the first three-time winner here at Texas. Well, tune in Sunday, June 24th on ABC at 1 p.m. Eastern for coverage of the Ethanol IndyCar 250 from the new Iowa Speedway. This has been a presentation of ESPN, the worldwide leader in sports. Coming up next, if you missed it earlier, the NASCAR Bush Series at Nashville. Congratulations one more time to Sam Hornish Jr. for our entire ESPN crew. I'm Marty Reed. We'll see you next time till we meet again. This ESPN telecast of the NASCAR Bush Series in Nashville is available in high definition on ESPN2 HD.